It was a crisp fall morning as I topped the hill on that dirt path that led to my grandma's house. For long as I could remember, I always dropped by her house on Saturday mornings to see if she needed any help around the house. Plus, I knew there was a good chance of getting a belly full of fresh cookies while I was there. Just then, I saw Granny Tollett leaning back in her high back rocker while she worked on a basket of knitting. J.D., you got a nose on you like a coon dog. Seems like every time I do some baking, you come a running. She gave me a quick smile and told me to pull up a chair next to her. Sure enough, she already had a covered plate of cookies waiting on my arrival. Just then, the sound of an engine could be heard on the main road that passed in front of Granny's property. Yonder comes William Elroy in his new car. Just look at him. I do believe he grows younger and handsome every day of his life. A sweet-faced woman sat beside him, and two pretty girls were in the seat behind him. Indeed, William Elroy looked every inch of a perfect specimen of a gentleman farmer of East Tennessee. Who's that, Granny? I asked. Why, only the richest man in the county, Granny replied as she followed the vanishing car with her keen glaze. He went to the legislator last winter, the Honorable William Elroy. They call him now. Yeah, but I can remember a time when he was just Smiley Russell's boy. And there wasn't nothing honorable about him either. Boy, the stories I could tell you about him. I grabbed another cookie off the plate and said, Well, tell me one. Why, well, I hardly know just where to begin, Granny Tollett replied wrinkling her forehead and adjusting her needles. Telling a story is something like winding off a ball of yarn. There's just two ends of it, though if you can get a hold of the right one, it's easy work. But there's so many ways of beginning a story, you never know which one leads straightest to the point. Well, you asked me who William Elroy was. Well, he was the son of Bill Elroy, and Bill was the son of William Elroy, the old squire. It's curious to me how you can name two boys William, and one of them will always be called William, and the other one will always be called Bill. And I've noticed that you can tell what sort of a man a boy is going to be just by knowing whether folks call him William or Bill. I ain't saying every William is a good man and every Bill is a bad one. All I mean is that there's much difference between Bill and a William. Anyway, there's been a William in the Elroy family as far back as you could track them. And all of them are good, steady, God-fearing men. Uh, until Bill came along. He was an only child, and of course, that made a bad matter worse. Anyhow, I'll say this. There are some men that are just born to get women into trouble, and Bill was one of them, just as handsome as a picture, and two years ahead of his age when it comes to size, and a way about him from the time he put on his pants that just showed what kind of a man he was cut out for. If the children were playing Jenny put the kettle on, he got kissed ten times to any other boys once, and if we were playing drop the handkerchief, Every little girl in the ring would be dropping behind Bill to get him to run after her. And that was the only time he ever did any running. All he had to do was just sit still, and the girls would do the running. He was that way all his life. The only girl that appeared to be anything like a match for him was Annie Crawford, old man Bob Crawford's daughter. Now, old man Bob was one of the kind that thinks the more children they got, the bigger men they are. And he was mighty proud of his sons, but he wanted a daughter more than anything. And when they kept turning out boys, he got crazier and crazier for a girl. And he wasn't born till he was past 60 years old. And he liked to lost his senses with joy. Well, of course, Annie was bound to be spoiled, especially after her mother died when she was just four years old. On top of that, old man Bob raised all his boys on the spare the rod, spoil the child principle. But when Annie came along, he turned his back on old Solomon and gave out that Annie mustn't be crossed by anybody. Well, Annie was a headstrong, high-tempered child to begin with. And having nobody to control her, she got to be the worst youngin', I reckon, in the whole state of Tennessee. I used to feel right sorry for her brothers. They couldn't keep a top or a ball or a marble or any plaything to save their lives. Annie would cry for them just for pure meanness. And whatever it was that Annie cried for, they had to give it to her or get a whipping. As soon as she got old enough, old man Bob carried her with her everywhere he went. On county court days, you could see him going along on his big gray mare with Annie behind him holding on to the sides of his coat with her little fat hands. And in the evening, about sunset, here they'd come, Annie on the front, fast asleep, and old man Bob holding her with one arm and guiding his horse with the other. Harvesting times, Annie be out there in the field sitting on a stack of wheat and ordering the hands around as if she was some kind of overseer. And old man Bob would just stand back and shake his sides, laughing and say, That's right, honey. Make them move lively. If it wasn't for you, 
Pappy couldn't get his harvesting done. Every fall and spring, he'd go to town and buy clothes for her. And people used to say, the storekeepers laid out extra stock just for old man Bob. He'd walk into Tom Baker's store with the saddlebags on his arm and holler out, bring out your finest silk, boys, and remember that the best ain't good enough for my little gal. Well, when Annie was about 12 years old, he took her off to Jefferson City to get her education. When he come to say goodbye to her, he cried and then she cried, and it ended with him sitting down and staying for about three weeks in Jefferson City, just waiting for little Annie to get over her homesickness. I tell you, folks never did quit laughing about him going off to boarding school. As soon as Sam Crawford saw him, he said, Well, Uncle Bob, when do you reckon you'll get your diploma? I shall never forget the first time Annie came home to spend Christmas. The neighbors didn't have any peace in their lives for old man Bob telling them how Annie had grown and how there wasn't a gal in the state that could hold a candle to her. And Sunday, he come walking into church with Annie hanging on his arm. He was just so proud and happy as if like he'd got a new wife. I reckon Annie had improved, and it wasn't just her looks. She was always as pretty as a picture, but she was now nice-mannered and just well-behaved as a girl you'd want to see. There was just as much difference between her and what she used to be as there is between a tame fox and a wild one. Of course, the wildness is all still there, but kind of covered up under the cute little tricks and ways. And that's the way it was with Annie. Now, William Elroy's pew was just across the aisle from old man Bob's. And I could see Bill watching Annie during the church. But Annie never looked one way or the other. She just sat there with her hands folded and her eyes straight. And nobody would have ever thought that she'd been riding horses bareback or climbing rail fences ever since she could walk. And when she came back from school in June, it was the same thing over again. Old man Bob bragging on her, saying how sweet and pretty she was. And Bill began to wait on her right away. And before long, folks were saying that they was made for each other, especially since their farms joined one another. Now that's a fool's notion, but you can't get it out of some people's heads. Well, things went on this way for about two or three years. Annie going and coming and getting prettier all the time. And Bill waiting on her whenever she was at home and carrying on between times with every girl in the neighborhood. At last, Annie came home for good. And Bill dropped all the others in a hurry and set out in earnest to get Annie. Folks said he was mightily in love. But according to my way of thinking, there wasn't any love about it. The long and the short of it was that Annie knew how to manage him while all the other girls didn't. They was always right there in the neighborhood. And it don't help a woman to always be under a man's nose. But Annie was here and there and everywhere, visiting in town in Knoxville and bringing the town folks and the city folks home with her and having dances and picnics and doing all she could to make Bill jealous. Now, I always believed that Annie was just as crazy about Bill as the rest of the girls, but she had sense enough not to let him know it. It's human nature, you know, to want things that's hard to get. Why, I reckon if fleas and mosquitoes were scarce, Folks would go a hunting them and making a big fuss over them. And Annie had made herself hard to get. And that's why Bill wanted her so bad. Everybody was saying what a blessed thing it was and how Bill would give up his wild ways and settle down. Well, along in the spring, a year after Annie had got through with school, Sally Ann came to me and she said, Miss Tollett, I saw something last night and it's been bothering me ever since. And she went on to say how she was going home about dusk and how she had seen Bill and Miley Russell at the turn of the road that used to lead up to Miley's house. And they were standing underneath a wild cherry tree by the fence corner. And the elderberry bushes were so thick that all you could see was Bill's head and shoulders and the top of Miley's head. But they looked to be mighty close together. And Bill was stooping over and whispering something to her. Well, now that set me to thinking. I recollect seeing Bill coming down the lane one evening about sunset, about the same time that I caught sight of Miley, walking away in the other direction. The women's group met at church the next day, and Sally Ann and me brought it up to the group. So we talked it over, and it come out that every woman in there had seen the same things we'd been seeing, but nobody had really said anything about it to the others because they weren't certain. Well, something ought to be done about this, Sally Ann said. It'd be a shame to let that poor child go to destruction right before our eyes, when a word from us might save her. Young Miley is fatherless and pretty much motherless too. You see, Miley's family were tenants of old Squire Elroy. And after Miley's father died of consumption, the old Squire just let him live there, just the same as before. 
Miss Elroy would give them quilting and sewing to do, and they had their little garden, and they managed to get along just well enough. Now, some folks called them poor white trash, and they was poor enough, goodness knows, but they was just as clean and hard working, and that's two things that trash never is. I used to hear that Molly's mother came from a good family, but she had married beneath herself and got down in the world, like folks always do when they're cast off by their own people. Miley had come up like a wild rose in a fence corner, and she was just the kind of girl to be fooled by a man like Bill. Handsome and smooth talking, with all the ways and the manners that take women in. Emily Crawford used to say that it made her feel just like a queen just to see Bill take his hat off to her. But I tell you, if men's manners match their hearts, honey, it'd be a heap easier world for us women. But whenever you see a man that's got good manners and a bad heart, you know there's trouble ahead for some woman. Well, anyway, us women folks talked it over till dark, and we all agreed that something needed to be done. But you know how it is when everybody's business is nobody's business. I thought Sally Ann would go and talk to Miley and give her a word of warning. And Sally Ann thought that I'd do it, and so it went. In the end, nothing was said. And before long, it was all over the neighborhood that poor little Miley was pregnant. Some of the men folk did try to talk to old man Bob. But law child, you might as well have been talking to the east wind. All he would say is if little Annie wants Bill Elroy, she's gonna have him. And that's what he'd been saying ever since Annie was born. Nobody said anything to Annie. And she was the sort of girl who didn't care whose feelings she trampled on. If she just got her own way. So it went on. And the wedding day was set, and nothing was talked about but Annie's first day dress and her second day dress, and how many ruffles she had on her petticoats, and what the lace on her nightgowns cost. And all that time, there was poor Miley Russell, crying her eyes out, night and day, and all us women folk getting up our old baby clothes for Bill Elroy's unborn child. Annie always said she was going to have a wedding that this county had never seen, and she kept her word. Old man Bob had the house fixed up inside and out. They sent up to Maribel for the cakes and things. And the wedding cake was three feet high. There was a solid gold ring on it. And the bridesmaids cut it. And every girl there had a slice of the bride's cake to carry home and dream on that night. Annie's wedding dress was white satin. And it was so heavy that it would stand on its own. Annie and Bill were married in October. About the time the leaves fell. And Miley's boy was born the last of November. Lord, what a world this is. Old man Bob wouldn't hear of Annie leaving him, so they stayed right in the old home place. In them days, folks didn't go eloping all over creation as soon as they got married. They settled down to housekeeping like sensible folks all too. Old Lady Elroy, she was just as foolish over Bill as old man Bob was over Annie. So it was laid down beforehand that they was to spend half their time at old man Bob's and half the time at Squire's. And that was about the worst thing they could have done. The further a young couple can get from the old folks on both sides, the better it is for everybody concerned. And besides, Annie wasn't the type of girl to get along with Bill's mother. A girl with the kind of raisin Annie had wasn't any fit for a daughter-in-law, and especially for a high-stepping woman like old lady Elroy. Now, there were some people that expected a heap better of Bill after he married, but I never did. If a man can't be faithful to a woman before he marries her, he ain't likely to be faithful after he marries her. And sure enough, before the shine was off of Annie's wedding clothes, Bill was back to his old ways of drinking and a carrying on with all the women, the same as ever. And the first thing we knew, him and Annie had a big quarrel, and old man Bob had ordered him off his place. But they made up, and they went over to the old squires to live. And things went well enough until Annie's baby was born. Bill had his heart set on having a boy, but it turned out a girl. And as soon as they told him that, he never even asked how Annie was. He just went out to the stable and saddled his horse and galloped off. And nobody seen him for two days. Now, he didn't have to take on like that. For the poor little baby didn't live but a week. Annie had convulsions over Bill leaving her that way. And the doctor said that's what killed the child. And I tell you, Annie was never the same after that. She grieved for her child and she lost her good looks. And when she lost them, she lost Bill. It wasn't long before Bill was living with his father and she was living with hers. At last, he went out west, and in less than three years, Annie died. And it's a good thing she did, for a more soured, disappointed woman 
couldn't have been found anywhere. Well, all this time, Miley's baby was growing in grace, and a finer child never was born. Miley had named him William, and nature had wrote his father's name all over him. He was the living image of Bill, but the look in his eyes, well, that was Miley's, and she worshipped him. And there were few children that were ever raised more careful and better than Miley's boy. And that's what we always called him. Miley was nothing but a child herself when he was born. But all at once, she appeared to turn into a woman. And she acted and she looked like one. Granny Tollett paused for a moment and she looked over at me. It ain't time, honey, that makes people old. It's experience. Some folks never get over being children. And some never had any childhood. And poor little Miley... Hers was cut short by trouble. If she ever felt ashamed of herself or the child, nobody ever knew it. I never could tell if it was a lack of sense or just she just looked at things different than the rest of us. But to see her walking into church, nobody would have ever thought that she was anything but a lawful wife. No woman could have behaved better than she did, I'm bound to say. And she got better looking all the time. And she was just as steady and sober as if she'd been 60 years old. It seems right strange to talk about dignity in a poor girl who had made a misstep like she did. But I reckon that's what made us all come to treat her as if she was just as good as anybody. Honey, people can set their own price on themselves, I've noticed. And if they keep it set, folks will come up to it. And Miley didn't seem to think she had done anything wrong. And when she brought little William up to the baptism, there wasn't a dry eye in the church. And when she joined the church herself, there wasn't anybody mean enough to say a word against it. Not even Silas Petty. Well, old Squire Elroy gave her the cottage rent-free after her mother died. And between nursing and doing fine needlework, she made a good living for her and the boy. And little William was a child worth working for from the start. Tall and straight as a sapling. And carried himself like he owned the earth. Even when he was just a little fella, it looked like all the good blood on both sides had come out in him. And there wasn't a smarter, more handsome boy in the county. The old Squire thought a heap of him. And it wasn't nothing but his pride that kept him from owning the child outright and treating him like he was his own flesh and blood. William had an old head on young shoulders, and he was just as full of life as any boy. And by the time he was grown, the old squire trusted him with everything on the place and looked at him just the same as if he had been a settled man. Well, all these years, nobody ever heard nothing from Bill. Every once in a while, somebody would come to town and say they'd seen him or somebody that looked like him. Some folks would say that they heard Bill was out in California, or Lord knows where. That's all the news that would ever come back. We had all just about made up our minds that he was dead. When one morning, along in the corn planting time, the news was brought and spread all over the neighborhood, in no time, that Bill Elroyd had come home to his father's and was lying at the point of death. Just like the prodigal son, after 20 years... It takes some folks a long time, child, to get tired of the swine and the husk. Well, of course, it made a big commotion. And before we'd hardly taken it in, we heard that he had sent for Miley. Now, we had a young traveling preacher that summer. And as soon as he heard about Bill, he went up to the big house without being sent for to talk to him about his soul. I reckon he thought it would be a feather in his cap if he could convert a hardened sinner like Bill. He sat down beside his bed and he began laying off a plan of salvation, just like he was preaching from the pulpit. And Bill listened and never took his eyes off of his face. And when the preacher got through, Bill said, Do you mean to tell me that all I've got to do to keep out of hell and to get into heaven is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And Brother Jonas said, That's right, my dear friend. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And just then, Bill began to laugh a curious sort of laugh. It's a mighty fine God that would make such a bargain as that. But let me tell you something, preacher man. I was born bad, and I've lived bad, and I'm dying bad. And I ain't no coward or no sneak, and I'm going to hell for my sins like a man. Like a man, do you hear me? The look in his eyes was just awful, and the preacher turned white as a sheet. And he sure was some curious talk for a deathbed. But when you come to think about it, it's reasonable enough that when a man's got hell in his heart, what good is it going to do to get him into heaven? Now, when we all heard that Miley had been sent for, the first thing we thought, how on earth is Miley going to tell young William all he's got to know about his father? And they said that Bill nearly gasped when Miley came walking into the room. I reckon he expected to see the same little girl that he had fooled some 20 years ago. 
And when she came walking in, it just took him by surprise. Why, Miley, is that you? Miley was so gentle and sweet looking. And there he was, all wore out and bad living and wasted to a shatter of what he used to be. I've seen the same thing, child, over and over again. Two people who start out together, and after a while, they'll get separated. Or maybe they'll live together a lifetime. And when they get to the end of 15 or 20 or 25 years, one of them will be just where they were when they started out. And the other one will be way up and way on. And then all of a sudden, they're just strangers after all. And that's the way it was with Miley and Bill. They had been sweethearts, and there was the child. But the father had gone his way, and the mother had gone hers. And now there was nothing between them. And there was a gulf just as big as the one the Bible talks about. Well, Bill looked up at Miley like a hungry man looks at bread. And he says, Miley, I'm going to make an honest woman out of you. And Miley just looked at him in his eyes and said just as gentle and easy as if she'd been talking to a sick child. I've always been an honest woman, Bill. And this kind of took him back. And he said right earnest and pitiful, I want to marry you, Miley. Don't refuse me. I want to do one decent thing before I die. I've come all the way from California just for this. Surely you'll feel better if you're my lawful wife. And Miley just stood there for a moment. Bill, I'm only here so my son can see his father just once with his own eyes. So Miley went and called William in. And as soon as Bill saw him, he raised up on an elbow as weak as he was. And he hollered out so loud that you could hear him in the next room. Why, it's myself. It's me. Stand off there where I can see you, boy. Why, you're the man I ought to been and I couldn't be. These lying doctors, they say that I ain't got but a day to live, but I'm going to live another lifetime in you. And then he fell back, gasping for breath. All the while, young William stood there in the middle of the floor with his arms folded and his face looking like it was made out of stone. Boy, won't you shake hands with your father? But William never stirred. And Miley got up and she went to him. And she laid her hand on her son's arm. Son, won't you come speak to your father? Finally, young William walked up to Bill and took his poor wasted hand in his strong one. And he looked sternly into his eyes. Just to be clear, I'm only here to support my mama. Just like I always have. I'm the person that I am today because of her. And then were the only words he said to his father. And he turned and he left. The doctor said Bill would live through the night. And sure enough, he began to sink just as soon as young William and Miley left. And he died the next morning about daybreak. Miley didn't live long after this. They found her dead in her bed one morning. The doctor said it was heart disease. But it's my belief that her work here on earth was done. She had lived for her son, William, and raised him into a fine man for the past 20 years and saw him come into his rights. I tell you, dying for people is a lot easier than living for him anyhow. Now, the old squire did not live Miley by many years, and when he died, young William came into all the Elroy property. You've seen the Elroy place, haven't you, child? That big white house with the big pillars and the porches in front of it. There's three miles of it along the pike. And folks will drive out there just to look at it. I've heard them call it the Colonial Mansion or some name like that. It was just all run down when William came into possession of it. But now it's one of the finest places in the whole state. That's the way it is with families. One generation will tear it down and another generation will build it up. And here's William building up all that his father tore down. And I for one hope that his work lasts for many a days. Granny Tollett's voice ceased. And there was a long silence. The full harvest of storytelling was over. But sometimes there was an aftermath to Granny's tale. And for this I waited. I looked at the field opposite where the long, verdant rose gave promise of the autumn reaping. And my thoughts were busy tracing backward every link in the chain of circumstances that stretched between Miley Russell's boy of 40 years ago and the handsome, prosperous man that I had just seen this morning.